Okay, hello everyone, and welcome to another Formit Friday. This is Tom Valaro. I'm the product manager for Formit, joined my, by my regular cast of characters, Tobias Hathorn and Josh Goldstein. And then we also have a special guest presenter with us today, Mike Engel from ESG Architects, who is joining us uh, his second time. This is our first return visitor for Formit Friday. Um, so I'm going to, uh, I'll give a little intro, um, bio for Mike, um, uh, reading off of his Autodesk university webpage. Um, so Mike's an associate at, and designer at ESG architects in Minneapolis. Um, he's spoken at Autodesk university, Revit technology conference before, and has a focus on formulating and developing integration between design and production teams. And he has a passion for integrating designers' conceptual hand sketches and artwork into modern technological tools. So that's a little taste of what we're going to be talking about today. And um, I met Mike uh, probably three years ago when he was tweeting about his use of Formit and, and Sketchbook together. I think that's right, Mike. Is that right? Probably about three years ago? Sounds about yeah. right. Yeah. Um, and that's a that's a little bit of a plug for people on in the webinar. If you uh, if you want to be presenting here someday or um, kind of get integrated with the product teams, a great way to do it is tweet out images of what you're working on because we love to see what people are doing. And uh, kind of started this conversation with Mike and about particularly this idea of sketching and how sketching has evolved into this new world of computational and generative design. And so it's definitely a topic that I'm very passionate about, Mike's passionate about, so kind of had this ongoing conversation. So uh, let me, uh, before we get to uh, the main event, uh, I just want to highlight a couple things going on around the internets with Formit. I tried to do this last month, and if you were here, uh, I got cut off by a little audio glitch. So let's try this again. Um, so uh, Utopic City is uh, a project by one of our uh, European sales guys with Autodesk, um, Emmanuel de Giacomo, and um, he's done these fantastic futuristic sci-fi images with Revit for years. Um, he's transitioned recently to using Formit, so we're kind of excited to have him. So if, you, if you're on Facebook, he's primarily uses Facebook, so if you go on there, you can see uh, Emmanuel's work as Utopic City. Um, been tracking some interesting projects you know, through Instagram as well. This is Arturo Coelho, um, and uh, he's been doing so, some really cool non-architectural stuff and also architectural stuff, specifically with um, showing how he's been going from format um, to 3D printing, which is kind of fun to see. Um, and then there's Maya do Nove in uh, Brazil, and these guys are also very early adopters. Met, I met these guys probably around the same time I met Mike. Uh, I think I want to, I definitely want to have these guys on. Uh, they do some really fantastic design work um, and not just with Formit, with Revit and other tools, but, you know, I just, I just love the images they, they produce. So they posted this one recently. So they're still, still kind of at it. And what I like about this is that it's small firms. Like we have big firms adopting Formit, but also a lot of just small firms, you know, two, three people um, that can really show um, their use of technology uh, to, to, enhance their design work. And then just some really fun stuff, just like totally, a lot of our Android users, for whatever reason, they're just totally not architectural at all, <laughs> just like weird stuff like logo designs. This is like a logo for a TV station in Africa. Um, and I love seeing all these kind of weird, non-architectural uses, because in a lot of ways, Formit is really just a, is a good general purpose modeler. Um, to that end, this is a, a little project that I was working on last month, which are cookie cutters for my uh, superhero cookie cutters for my daughter's birthday party. Um, so, you know, just I, I tend to uh, have a bit of a bias, I guess, but I tend to fall back on format whenever I need a really just general purpose modeling tool. So fun stuff with format that are not buildings. Maybe we'll do a whole webinar on that one day. All right, and so now for the main event for today, I'm going to pass it over to Mike. Let's see here. All, All right. right, take it away. Should see my screen now. Um, yeah, so thanks, uh, Tom, and the, the whole team at Formit um, for 
creating for me, but just having me here. Um, so this is, uh, it's going to kind of be a summary of a, a class I did at AU this year, uh, really talking about, you know, redefining what is sketching uh, in the architectural design process. What does that mean in, in today with computers and tablets and technology? Um, and, and how could we start to mesh the two and, and maybe break down some of the conflicts uh, between different processes? Because one of the things I've heard throughout my career is, you know, you got to take it outside of the computer to, to design, and you can't design with technology. You can't design in the computer. You have to use a pen and a pencil. And, and I think with a lot of the advancements of, of tools like Formit and the iPad and tablets and Androids and all these, these variations that we have now, um, that whole wall and definition between computer and, and using that as a documentation tool versus a design tool uh, has really just blended into um, one whole thing that there's there's not necessarily a, a disconnect there anymore and, and that gets me really excited so that's what I just kind of talk about how I use that as a process and and how it kind of works pretty well I think so um, to start you know kind of as a big thing that I've always talked about is it's it's just this game of construction and creating something and I think too often we get bogged down by the tools we use but at the end of the day it, it really doesn't matter uh, what tools we use as long as we create uh, great products and, and great being both design and quality and, and however you want to define it. Um, but we all have different needs throughout a, a project life cycle and so trying to say that well we have to use Revit or we have to use this tool um, or we have to use a pencil it is not really a, a valid thing so you know as Jackson Pollock says just you know some choose a shovel some choose a pen but it's all about creating uh, and so, you know, to step back a little bit then, you know, as I talked, you know, a sketch, traditionally when people think about sketching, it, it's always about using a pencil and that's the first reaction. And, and really, when you step back and say, well, what is sketching? It, it's much more than that it, and much simpler than that. It's not about the tool, it's about what you're doing. And so a couple, you know, quick definitions on this slide is just, you know, it's, it's about creating a rough drawing uh, it's just a representation. It's a you know this idea of just something very tentative and a draft, um, and it's it's brief. It's quick. Uh, it doesn't really. None of these definitions say that it has to be with a pencil or paint or any of these or clay. Um, and so you know, in my mind, that means we can use any tool and even include very robust uh, tools such as Revit and BIM and uh, form it and you know getting into Fusion 360 those are all tools that we can use to to do these types of rough creation of objects and tentative ideas um, and getting away from just using computers as a pure uh, documentation and visualization tool um, and actually letting them inform us in the same way that drawing a line on a piece of paper would inform us. So. In the past, these are just a, a few random sketches as example of, you know, pen on paper, ink, very traditional what sketches are, or doing overlays. Um, and it, the interesting thing is when you look at these, you know, or there's really nothing that says these had to be done on a paper. It's just what people are used to. And this is, you know, when I was doing these sketches, it was what I had available. Today now, as I've, you know, the iPad has become kind of a focus of my tools. It's become my sketchbook of sorts, um, and the, even with the mobile laptop. So now my sketches look quite a bit different. You know, here we've got uh, some very quick sketches that vary from quick format models, massing diagrams of site programming, um, you know, and even starting to take it as far as saying, well, you know, using things like Dynamo to take what is a quick massing model and understand what are the sight lines and, and as I do these variables you know what does that mean to the sight lines and, and being able to do that quickly with some very robust and data driven tools is really no different than me taking and cutting out a piece of foam core and moving it on a piece of paper. Um, the real advantage that I see is I can get a lot more feedback and get through a lot more design iterations um, and presumably then get to a better solution a lot more uh, efficiently and effectively and with 
all of the projects we're working on, at least the timeline to get to these is getting shorter and shorter with a, a greater expectation of of quality. So, you know, and then there's just doing some quick solar analysis and even getting into fractal. But I mean, the one that kind of jumps out here is I still do a lot of hand sketching. Um, you know, you can see that bottom in the center there. It's just an overlay of a Revit model very quickly sketched over using Sketchbook Pro uh, on the iPad. So it's it's this constant back and forth between model and 2D and 3D and data um, with really just a lot of gray area in between. It's no longer do step A, then do step B. Um, and the work I'm doing, it, it's just back and forth constantly. And it's a little schizophrenic has been described to me as with people I work with. Um, but I'm okay with that. I, I've just learned to live with that's the process that, that works and, and it is. We're, we don't work in a linear process anymore. Probably never did. Um, so just generally speaking, again, you know, yesterday we had our, our bucket of pens and pencils and, and squares. Um, today we still have those, but the tools are now the different apps. They're the different software packages and hardware packages. And, and really a box of markers is just like having a series of apps for sketching on the uh, on a tablet format. So, uh, And then before we get into some examples of, of how this actually works, you know, I think this quote by Norman Foster is, is really critical when you think about, you know, what we use for tools with sketching and designing. That when it comes down to it, whether we choose to use a, this pencil or a pen or the very traditional tools we think of as design tools, or we start to use computers, it always comes back to the human that's creating those tools and driving those tools, um, and that neither of them are going to design projects without it, without the human. So, and end of the day, you know, before, it, in my mind, all that really matters is that you're creating something. Um, if you use some of the tools that I'll describe here and some of the processes. Uh, it's just the more you create, the more you work through, the more iterative uh, at the end of the day, the, the better product. So whether that's through traditional means or through technology, um, I can't stress enough that just create anything and everything. Um, so to get to some like examples of what does this actually look like in a workflow, um, this first kind of set is, is what I like to think of it as old school meets new school. So there's no paper involved, but yet it's very, you know, traditionally visually looking like a sketch. Um, so very often this is how I start projects. Uh, it's it started typically with like a Google Earth, something on the iPad, taking the image out um, and just starting to sketch over it in the same way that I might print down a survey and put a piece of trace paper over it. Um, in the past, I just open up my iPad, uh, open up my, my tablet PC, whatever I have, taking Google Earth and starting to, to get some very definitive and, and general characteristics of what this wants to be. Uh, and I would say the majority of time this is done you know, on an iPad, and it can be done anywhere. Uh, it really opens the doors that I can work from any location, really at any time that I, that I feel I need to or, or want to or have an idea. Um, and then very quickly, you know, I start to take this into format on the iPad, and it's kind of the, the really quick way of saying, well, I've created something 2D, and that's, that's a, a good first step. But to be able to then sketch at that same level in a 3D uh, format to get some context, you know, the, the fluidness of working in format on the iPad is, is just as efficient, in my opinion, as with a pen on a piece of paper. And as I start to work back and forth, you know, I'll take... I'll do the sketch first, get some general site layout, bring it in, get some more scale to it, get some massing, and, and very often I'll take screenshots and export images on the format model on my iPad and start sketching right over the top. In the past, that would have meant you know creating a model on a computer, printing it out, putting some trace paper over it, drawing over it, scanning it back in, updating the model. It, and with tablets, I can really do this you know iteratively, iteratively and rapidly uh, all kind of in one format and, and using these different tools of sketching and format in the same way as using clay models and, and pens that I would at my desk. Um, and then with the added advantage, this all flows into Revit. So, you know, what you saw that started as a very quick sketch can very quickly and directly 
uh, get into Revit. And part of the reason it goes into Revit then is not so much visualization, but just having that additional ability then to, to bring a little bit more of the BIM and the information into it and start to get square footages and uh, annotations. So, you know, what we saw is starting as that very quick sketch on the iPad um, within, you know, a few hours probably. Um, I can get to a, a pretty accurate and concise BIM model or Revit model uh, with data and information and produce deliverables um, accurately and effectively. And then these can all just flow continuously, you know, as we bring on more teams and start to articulate the wall assemblies and the details and really get into the, the construction level. That it's not a none of these processes are really a dead end. They always kind of flow into the next one. So, which is really important, I think, in the sketch process because. Sketching doesn't stop when you start in Revit and, and being able to continue to sketch even when you're working with these more data-driven programs I think is really critical to today's workflow. Um, you know, and then the added benefit is a lot of people tell me, well, I can sketch anywhere with a, with a notebook too. Um, what I think is, you know, you saw in the previous example, you know, you can get the 3D, but you know, this was just a, a really quick one literally from last week. Um, working on a, at a garage site and started a very quick sketch and idea of what is this garage in the shop and what's the site plan all drawn on the iPad. But again, I can bring that right into form and not only get that, that context massing, uh, but start to get some feedback. You know, getting solar analysis is, is kind of where you can start to say, here's some value that takes it beyond just a digital form of drawing, but you're actually you know, sketching in a way that you get feedback and inform the design. So that's uh, you know kind of this this really great benefit. So. And then there's kind of so that's kind of the the old school meets new school workflow that is where a lot of things start. But there's also this other side you know that getting more towards the generative design. I'm saying well, what about when you start with data? And so when I think about that, it's it's starting with Dynamo as a as a tool to generate massing based on inputs. Um, and I know Dynamo. A lot of people that I work with uh, get a little, little tentative about it and scared about it. You know, this is this is code, and and how does that define the model? And we can't let code drive the model. Um, personally, I think whether it's code or drawing, that that is what happens. Um, and at its simplest form, I always like to say, you know, Dynamo is is very simple. It's just about inputting, doing something with that, and then outputting. And in the case of sketching. Um, what I can start to do is is create kind of blocks, blocks with some data and variables that can flow right into. So what you're seeing here is you know, a block that builds hotels based on you know criteria. Uh, I can place it on a site very quickly, and then you know play with the graphics, which is valuable to understand some shading. Um, but then I can actually, as if I was in Dynamo, all my variables, you know, I can start to you know with the client say, you know, how many keys do you want? What are the sizes of the modules? What are the floor to floors? And get really immediate feedback in relationship to the, the site and the location and see how it fits. Um, you know, and there's been at least a couple times where I've been able to do this right in front of a client and, and get to kind of at least a general direction far quicker uh, than if you were to have a meeting for an hour, discuss it, spend a day, uh, drawing on it and come back and go, oh, well, actually, that doesn't work because we forgot this variable. Um, so this at least gets us to a, a direction very quickly with direct feedback. And the interesting thing here is, you know, this works really great with data, um, but a lot of people are like, well, what about, you know, the designer and how do they program things? You're letting the computer do it. And I think, you know, as this gets forward here, you know, you start to say, well, we just find the program, but now I can raise this thing up a little bit. And in the case of hotels, you know, I can start to program the, the under the first floor space, the, the more flexible space, the stuff that's different. And that's where the, the intuition still stays and the rapidness of sketching um, is still very, very critical. But you're starting to blend these two of, you know, leveraging data for one side and, and leveraging the, the intuition for the other side. So. Um, we'll slide through, and then you know, here just doing that same process with parking garages and being able to get this feedback. So, to me, this is 
as much about sketching as the, the first example with the pen. It's just about quickly doing it, iteratively doing it, and getting to a general idea uh, with the added benefit of getting some feedback. So. So I have a question, Mike. Uh, sure. th when you're working with clients at this stage, I mean, do they kind of get it that um, that they're looking at something that is at a low level of detail, and does that help or, or hinder the conversation? Um, for the most part, yeah. I mean, the, as you saw in the, the diagrams, there's not a lot of detail in those models, um, which most people intuitively understand then, you know, the lack of detail uh, then understand that there are things that are are approximate and it's actually one of the bigger issues I see with, with things like Revit where you can get so into and you can make things look so precise. Um, I see it with SketchUp a lot. You know, everything looks like it's thought out um, and figured out and you have the opposite issue where a client thinks you figured everything out only to get, you know, frustrated in DD and CDs to go, well, I thought this was all figured out. Why is it not working? And, and so keeping it really loose at those early stages and and getting that immediate feedback while maintaining a lot of general assumptions, um, I think actually helps the conversation and the client understanding. So, so then the next piece, you know, it's it's how do you bring this all together and what does this this mean as of maybe a, a bigger picture of of sketching a, a building and bringing that through and the process gets a lot more complicated but it's it's really the, the same part of it of starting with a sketch on the iPad that you see here and then you know this can just flow through tools like Formit and Dynamo and into Revit as, as real Revit geometry and we'll switch over here so if you uh, you saw that initial sketch and so very quickly I'll start to bring that into Formit and just really do these general massings. Um, there's not a lot of detail here, and, and I actually kind of like that. You know, again, what Tom was talking about was, you know, is it all thought out? Now that understanding, you know, this has a very simple level of detail that I understand the general massing. And one of the things that with any tool like like Formit and sketching, it's like where do you draw the line of what you model where? And what I've always found is how do you start to, you know, leverage tools for what they're really good at. Formit's really good at quick massings like this and being able to move things, um, you know, take blocks and copy them around. So I'll do a lot of this. Uh, just a quick study, but you can notice when you look at this uh, that it's really just grays and whites. Um, and really all I'm trying to articulate here is what is going to be fenestration areas, what is solid, what is planes, what are the blocks. Um, because there's tools that we can use that can window all this and put all those things on. And it's not so much in my mind about just creating those windows as a window, but being able to leverage the different tools to study them. Um, so you can see, you know, in this example, I can study blocks really quickly. I can just move them around, I can rotate them, um, and get to a general thing. But if I were to actually try and model windows in each of these, you know, that starts to get cumbersome. And that's where Revit Dynamo in my workflow really become an asset to the sketch workflow. So what I'll often do is I'll I'll get this massing set up and I'll select the objects I want. Um, and this is actually where I maybe break the, the typical rules of format is because I, I don't use the format uh, uh, tool to bring it into Revit. I just take this and export it and I just choose to export my selected objects to SAT. And I'll do this to a common file. A lot of times I'll just overwrite my old one. And the reason I do SAT is because then I can come over to the Dynamo side and the Revit side. And I can start to bring that geometry in and do things with it. Um, in the same way as I can analyze shading and things quickly on the iPad, I can start to analyze and articulate uh, a greater level of detail uh, more iteratively through Dynamo and Revit directly. Um, and part of the reason I started doing this with Dynamo and Revit was the, the plugin, while it, it's very powerful and useful, it didn't give me enough control and repetitiveness. So I wanted to figure out, well, how can I, how can I bring this thing into Revit iteratively and really start to, to do things with it and not have to start over each time? And it's just a, it's a relatively simple workflow I'll show you guys here, but, you know, SATs can come right into Dynamo. So we're just doing a really simple uh, select the file, browse onto it and import that SAT and just do some quick solids. So this is a, a one union. 
and I'll hit run in a second. Um, and then from there, we'll go through this a little detail, but you can kind of see what I zoom out. What I'm kind of doing is starting with a very general piece of geometry and really just starting to filter through some ideas. And these are just design rules in the same way that you might do a parking garage of, of criteria that you know you, you need to have your precast columns on a 28-foot grid. Uh, your windows can only be so big because that's the manufacturer allows. So it's it's putting in some of those criteria that are that are as much there when you're sketching by hand, and it's just kind of putting them in as a as as values and variables. Um, and so this does some checking, some filtering. We'll hit run. Uh, at the same time, it's also looking at the Revit model. Um, so I'm in a, a massing environment over here, and I've just got some some real general grid lines laid out and some levels laid out. And so this this script, when I run it, is going to look out. It's going to look for those those levels and those grids because that's you know what Revit is really good at that that rigidity um, that criteria. Uh, this should work takes a minute uh, the first time. But it's going to really intersect that with the, the massing geometry. And work through thinking. The nice thing is the second time is always faster. Come on. This also gives you time to go get a cup of coffee once in a while as you're sketching. Break the Break the habit of uh, just sitting at your desk all day. Come on. Yeah, we'll just blame Revit for the slowdown here. <laughs> yeah. Does anybody have any questions? Well, uh, let's see. I didn't, none have come in so far. Okay. We'll let that think for a little bit. I'll show you. You'll see. So we go back to PowerPoint. Um, so you can see in, in, in format, I was able to do this quick massing. And these are just generations of doing some quick massing changes and looking through that very quickly in those tools. Um, you know, doing what we just, what's thinking in the background. And as soon as it comes through, the other thing it does in Dynamo is it starts to color code. And this is just really a visual feedback. Uh, to me, to understand, well, what are the criteria's meaning? What is it finding, and, and what does that mean? And very often, I'll I'll run uh, Dynamo on automatic, and as I export and overwrite files from Format, this will just regenerate. I can get this direct feedback and see, you know, with some color coding, uh, what happens. So, all right, we got some some background here. Let's see, so you can see what it it did a little bit. I got some things hidden and frozen. Uh, we'll run this in stages, but it, initially it, it brings in, you know, what is my core and my essentially a foundation. And you can see the other thing it did is it took these grids um, and started intersecting. So things like columns that, while I could model them and inform it, just being able to use those grids and leverage that that intersection and some of the criteria to create those um, is far more efficient because I don't have to place each of those and move them and track them and update them. So uh, let's unfreeze a few things here. Should run that again. Make sure I got other things frozen. So that's so this should run a little bit quicker. Usually does. You can see it's already starting to generate, you know, what the Revit model is. There you go. So now you can see it, it kind of went through and you know, none of this is really high high level um, dynamo by any means. It's it's pretty straightforward and, and just leveraging it in a very repetitive way. Um, it's doing things like intersecting levels and creating floor plates. Um, the other thing you'll see is is it creates you know this blue band, which you can see. I don't think I should be coming to rub it, but basically, you know, in this case, I wanted to make sure I had a railing all the way around. Um, and rather than me trying to, to model that and form it, which I could do, and in many cases I do, I just it was far more efficient for this example to say, well, I need it around the full perimeter of the floor because I'm going to have balconies all the way around. So let's just intersect it and extrude that up. Um, again, just using a tool to do things efficiently. 
and we'll run this again and oops. Wrong. So unfreeze. This one's gonna take a little bit more. Um, but the next step is you know creating the geometry and then actually applying a series of Revit families directly to this. And so this is going to look out and do the same color coding. That's all sorted now. And based on some rules, it's going to start to apply solid objects and divided panels to that uh, geometry. You can do this all by picking faces, but this is just a way that, again, you know, I can make updates and inform it and push those through to, uh, to my model and you know, as a way to see this, if I go back, um, I can actually choose a different format model. And maybe it has some different implications too. We'll try three. Um, and we'll hit run again. I think you can see you start to get window patterns and uh, and study that. And I can actually start to drive, you know, maybe I want these to be random on each each level again something that's you know limited by direct modeling tools like format but when using some computational tools you can start to manipulate those so you can see here I've twisted some of the things and rather than you know deleting the mass and starting over and reapplying all these objects that you would traditionally have to do if you were to model this directly in Revit um, by using criterion rules and leveraging kind of the data side of it I can make changes in a in a direct modeling simple way and form it and let that feed through some criteria. Um, and we can even go so far when we talk about the panels starting to you know start to shift these. And again, you know, in a traditional workflow you would manually find your windows, you would slide them over, you maybe copy that up a couple floors and maybe shift it again. Um, but it's very limited by how much you can draw. And so these are some ways that I've learned that I can start to leverage my, my very quick ideas of what do I want to achieve and then let the computer kind of do the heavy lifting of uh, the model generation. And so it's, it's going through regenerating all those windows, panel layouts, and actually shuffling them a little bit. So. This is great, Mike. Um, no, no questions yet, but I'll, I'll ask a couple that I have. <laughs> um, so the um, those lines, that grid that you made, that's on the ground yep. plane. So those are just lines you made in Formit, and then they come through. No, those are the lines for the grids are actually made in Revit. So okay. it's kind of a standard grid spacing, a lot of times, um, and they're just model lines inside the the Revit massing environment. But how do you line those up to uh, the model that's created through the script? Is it just kind of uh, usually line what up? I end up doing is I, I my first iteration of the massing model I'll bring in um, a little more generically without applying window panels, and then I'll kind of just lay those out in generic fashion. As I need to adjust them, I can just select them inside of, of Revit and adjust them, and, and it'll move the, all of the column geometry as needed. So. Um, yeah, so it's actually pretty, you know, it's almost just like drawing your straight guidelines um, that you might on the first layer of trace, and then you put your second layer over it and draw the, the building footprint or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, so I can always go back to that first layer and, and manipulate them. Same thing with the, the floor levels. Um, so, but you can see, you know, quickly, you know, you can start to really generate some ideas and get some feedback directly um, and understand implications of designs more holistically uh, without spending hours of rework um, and remodeling. To model six generations of patterned windows uh, might be a day's work, um, but with a process like this, it's only a, a short uh, wait in the, the queue or processing power, which Yeah, so the level, so the floor of floor, the levels you had already also established in the in the Revit yep. model. Okay. Yep. So, uh, particularly because those are the things that you know are, are kind of critical and, and required. So, 
Um, you know, and often we may have programmatic reasons that those are decided before the, the shell is even considered. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so then at the end of the day, you know, you get this, oops, come on, workflow. Um, you know, of, of starting with this very loose sketch, you know, that idea of just creating an idea and being able to do that quickly, starting to mass and, and put some scale and, and accuracy to it, doing analysis and then generating these. And, you know, as I change things on these and change maybe some of the criteria of my mind, what are some requirements? Maybe it's structural feedback. You know, I can plug any of that stuff in here and directly see the implication of, of how the initial design concept is affected by those and what does that mean for the output. And, and being able to manipulate each layer in, in, in the same way you might manipulate each layer of trace paper on your desk. Um, and then, you know, taking it and rendering it and presenting it to clients and, and defining it. So, and then the really cool thing I always find is, you know, all the stuff when you start to pick up these tools and, and when they work together as a team rather than as distinct, you know, model it and, mo and software A and then software B throughout the design process and construction process. If you're, if all these tools that you're starting to work with work together nicely, as they, they say in the Lego movie, um, everything is just, just awesome. So it's my favorite thing to say in the office. Um, so yeah, so just this is kind of the my sketch process, I guess, in, the, in summary of starting with these very basic sketches on the iPad, using things like Sketchbook Pro and, and Paper and Trace and, and a variety of applications, and then just having this constant back and forth between Format and Dynamo and Revit and, you know, bi-directionally updating all these things, so. Um, and that's, uh, that's the process in a nutshell, so. All right, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, so, yeah, another, another uh, just sort of technical process question I had was, yeah, so the way you, when you make a change, on the format side, you just kind of overwrite your the the SAT file, and then yeah. and then just rerun the script, and you don't even need to reset that select that browse node, right? It just reformats yeah. everything. Yeah. So most of the time, uh, when I'm running this in, in real production work, I won't save maybe multiple versions. Um, I'll just you know make changes in here, and with a usually a pretty quick SAT. Um, either using visible only, if I have a view like this, it has just the geometry I need, um, or select it only, and then do export. And I'll just, yeah, I'll have a common uh, location, and I'll just overwrite that file and very often have uh, Dynamo with Revit sitting on, I'll come down to, to Dynamo and actually set this to automatic. So, I mean, there's cases where I've set this up on two computers maybe for more larger models and, and sync it through the server, through cloud services that I can be sketching and exporting something in format um, and just letting Dynamo kind of chug on automatic and continually, you know, evolving what's in the Revit model to, uh, to see that implication. So, um, yeah. And so I don't know how deep you want to get into the Dynamo script, but so then you have, you kind of have the floor plates drawn out yeah. in, in format, and then those that go out to SAT, and then is the Dynamo script just kind of looking at those, like taking each solid and then analyzing them and then pulling out yeah. curves from them? Yeah, that's essentially what it's doing. Um, I've done this both ways. Right now I'm running this all within the massing environment, so these aren't floors per se. Uh, they're really just geometry representing the floor. You can do the same workflow running directly in a project and generate you know, real Revit floors of specific criteria. Um, and as you get further in the design process, very often that does happen. Uh, but yeah, in this case, I'm really just intersecting the levels that are already in the project with my format generated geometry, um, getting some, uh, getting the surface of that intersection and then extruding it based on the thickness. Um, mm -hmm. And then the same thing with uh, you know columns, getting in, the, getting those lines from that category again, intersecting it with my uh, different geometries, 
uh, removing a couple things, maybe if they don't intersect, sometimes I'll shrink the model and so they're floating out in space. So doing some basic filtering on that level, uh, but getting some basic extrusions. The, the wall panels are a little bit more complicated. Again, in the project environment, I'll do this and, and maybe apply direct wall assemblies to it. In this case, I'm using um, actually adaptive components and curtain panels. So you can see based on what I filter for different sizes, you know, if they're square, if they're wider than they are tall, mm -hmm. what type of panel do I get put on them? Um, and then creating some divided panels with some patterning and, uh, you know, generating that using some direct shapes to get some quick things. And, right. and none of this is really about creating a super robust BIM model. Um, while you could do that, this is really about just being able to work quickly and, and iteratively at a very early stage to understand, you know, based on criteria, what are the implications of a, a design concept and how do that, does that relate to some general uh, assumptions, so. Right, yeah, and that was actually, um, it was another, there's a couple of questions came in, but I, I have one more <laughs> my own, so. Um, yeah, so you're, though they're creating direct shapes and in Revit, and if people don't know what direct shape is, it's a kind of internal method inside Revit that is used um, to create elements from Dynamo and IFC and other external sources. Uh, it creates essentially what is a floor or a wall or a column. Um, but yeah, so follow up to what you just said, you know, it's not like a full BIM, but where would you go with this next? Like, let's say you get kind of sign off, um, kind of how would you take this to the next level if the project progresses? Uh, so very often the next level is, uh, you know, in the case where it's a mass like this, I'll bring it into an actual Revit project file and, uh, you know, maybe I'll, I'll disconnect the floor pieces so I'm no longer creating floors through Dynamo uh, as placeholder floors here, uh, but actually create those directly in the project as real floors as I learn assemblies. Same thing with columns, those become structural actual structural columns placed at these intersections rather than just simplified extrusions. Um, in the case where I use these adaptive panels, you know, those can be categorized as windows and brought directly in. So what you end up with is a mass that has the panels all hosted to it for your fenestrations and then your railings and your columns and the, the more detailed elements, the system families, uh, kind of nest within that. So you have kind of these two, two objects um, which is kind of nice because then as you get more teams and partners involved, you know, they're very, your slab and your structural guys, they're very particularly, you know, we got to get these slabs coordinated, the columns coordinated, but you may still be shifting the windows. So you're kind of giving people control over the items they need control over and giving the flexibility where we can still flex it. So. Mm -hmm. uh, so another question from the audience so and I had this one too is uh, how do you show the grid lines and the levels in that Revit 3D view? Uh, that is because it is the oops let me go back to it um, yeah so this is it's, it's the massing environment it's not a project environment and so in the massing environment you see levels in 3D um, and I think it's been that way for quite a while mm -hmm. um, so we turn off the crop region but yeah so this is just your basic uh, massing family. Okay, so that. it's not in the project yet. Okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So this is an RFA technically. Mm -hmm. um, I guess they're pinned. So yeah. So these are levels. Uh, they're a little different. Um, they behave a lot of the same ways, but they are not. They're not project levels, and that's the difference. So this is the the family editor. So. Right, okay. Which is nice, because then the, the team can work in the project and you can study things in here uh, separate and not worry about the implications directly always. So, so another uh, question back to the iPad. So are you, when you say you're using the iPad, are you using the iPad Pro and the Apple Pencil? This is from an I am. Question, audience question. Yeah, I use the iPad Pro and the Apple Pencil. I think it's amazing. Um, I've tried a few Android tablets. I've tried. I've been using iPad since the first generation, and, and that has, in my opinion, just opened doors. But the current generation of the pencil is 
you know, it's even starting to replace, uh, in my opinion, drawing on Cintiqs and some really high-end Wacom tablets. So, um, yeah. And so some of those sketches you showed in your earlier presentation were done with the iPad? Uh, pretty much everything. The only sketch in this whole presentation that was not done on the iPad uh, is these ones. The truth is, this is iPad, and this is iPad. These are actually, these three are iPad, too. Uh, but these five sketches are the only sketches and images in the whole presentation that were not done on an iPad uh, or things that were generated in Revit. But, um, yeah, all of this all of this was done over a cup of coffee at my kitchen table. Uh, yeah. on the iPad. So, That's great. That's impressive. And so you show sketchbook, paper, and more folio, those kind of your three go-to yeah. sketching apps. Yep, yeah, they're, uh, and I'm not sure that one is necessarily any larger percentage. They all have their their advantages and disadvantages. Um, but yeah, those are those are probably the primary three, and they're probably all each about a third of my workflow, mm -hmm. depending on the day and which one I open first. So. Have you, um, I've been playing with another one recently called Concepts. Have you tried it? It's been around for a long time, but uh, I've works. tried it. Yeah. Um, I've tried it on and off. I've never found it worked that well for me. Um, uh, I think a lot of it comes back to personal preference. Yeah, I mean, paper is super simple just because, but then I like concepts because some of the vector stuff they have, but it does, the trade-off is that the UI tends, then suddenly you've got a lot more things you're managing in terms of, you know, settings and things, so there is a bit of a trade-off there. Yeah, the, the way I always try when I look at new sketching apps is I, uh, I give them to my daughters who are in kindergarten and <laughs> second grade now. And, and it's, it's a really a cool test because I basically give them these drawing apps on their iPad and be like, hey, go draw. And if they don't have a lot of questions and can very intuitively just pick those up and, and start drawing and creating stuff with them, um, my reaction then is they're they're simple enough and intuitive enough that they get out of my way as a designer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and and there's the other side of that. Obviously, Dynamo and Revit are like the other extreme of that, um, and it's probably one of the difficulties. But you know, when I think about tools that I want to work quickly and iteratively with, I think that's a an amazing litmus test, and yeah, works pretty well. They can't even figure out format. <laughs> so. Yeah, well, it's it's a good uh, way of putting it. I mean, that's actually what we strive for uh, with Format, and uh, and it it is a difficult balance between power and uh, and simplicity. It's always a line we walk pretty much every day. But um, but yeah, I, I also give my my uh, fourth grader likes to draw, and she said the other day, "Can you log in here so I can get Sketchbook Pro?" <laughs> I, said, I said, "Oh, sure." <laughs> Got, since I got the App Store locked down, she couldn't just buy it. Um, yeah. But, uh, yeah, well, thank you for this uh, presentation. And uh, really, uh, it's interesting to kind of see how you've been progressing through this, even just from AU. Uh, it's kind of a – your your process is evolving. And it seems like, I'm assuming, kind of each project adds a, adds a little bit of tweaks to it as you go. Is that true? Yeah, pretty much uh... – Every day, I probably tweak it a little bit for, <laughs> for better or worse, with the rest of my team. Um, it's I'm a I'm a firm believer in having firm standards for design process, but as everybody I work with knows, I'm also the first person to break all those standards in the uh, in the search for a better and more effective way. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good way of putting it. All right, cool. Well, um, if there's no other questions uh, from the audience here. Um, I did sort of promise a little peek at uh, some of the stuff that we're working on and on the product development side. So I'll, um, would we have a few minutes left? I'll, uh, I'll switch over just a taste. Uh, we're going to be doing uh, probably in the spring a more in-depth uh, presentation on what uh, is coming in our next release. But we were um, having our, what we call a sprint demo, which is uh, every two weeks the development team does an internal demo of what's new. 
Um, and I was excited by some of the stuff that uh, we were working on. So I thought I'd, I'd give a quick, quick demo of that. So uh, one of the things we're working on, well, one of the things you probably won't be able to see very easily today is the performance. Um, and I hope a lot of you are happy to hear that we're doing a lot of work on graphics and in model performance. So I'm sure this won't come across very well in GoToMeeting, but you know, you know, orbiting and navigating through this model with lots and lots of uh, elements is just is super fast. Um, and we can I can quantify it better than just super fast, but you'll have to take my word for it for now. <laughs> um, so another thing we're doing is uh, a lot of work on materials. Um, and that includes sort of the um, inter user interface of how materials are managed. And um, let me just show you another cool thing is um, we're doing also a lot of work with groups. So if I double click this group, you'll notice everything else hid in the scene. And um, I can toggle this on and off with the H key. So I'm gonna press H, press H again. So you get this really nice way of hiding um, or focusing on the group that you're editing, which I love. And you'll notice this is a Dynamo-based group, which there's some work coming there as well. But I'm just gonna show quickly some of the stuff with materials. Now this won't look terribly different, um, but a few significant things. One is all of the materials now are done, are managed at the file or the sketch level. They're not broken down by group anymore, which was very, um, uh, a little bit hard to manage. So you'll see, um, I can just edit this one glass material that's applied to many groups. And if I change its color, you know, you'll see it, it'll, it'll update itself across all the groups. So I can manage it in one place, um, which is, uh, which is very handy. Um, a couple other things, and just in terms of the interface, um, if I select um, an element with that material, it'll it'll highlight the material in the panel that's um, currently selected. So you'll see I've got um, this group that contains both this frosted white and this glass material. So it gives you a little indicator that it's being um, selected. I can also uh, just uh, tap or click on the thumbnail and it'll put me immediately into paint mode. So I can actually, if I press the H key, um, I can come out here and paint um, other other um, surfaces with that material. So just some, some nice little quick um, changes that we have um, in, the, in the interface. Uh, and there's more, uh, we have purge and this eyedropper, but I'm, I'm just gonna kind of leave it at that. It's just a little taste of what we have uh, to come. And we'll be doing, like I said, just to kind of give you guys some a uh, little excitement about what's coming later this spring in uh, in the next release. So let's see if that generated any questions. Super fast is descriptive enough. Okay, that's good to know. <laughs> so the focus on group that you're editing in H key will this work in the web-based app? Um, so I'm gonna defer that one to Josh, who's on the line. Yep. It will? It All will. right. Yeah. That's a nice. And, I, and iOS too. Oh, awesome. So without the H key though, uh, how do you toggle it's that in, on uh, iOS? In the settings menu, the settings gear, there's a there's a toggle in there um, for hiding everything outside the group. And then, and then Jared's asking, will the performance also apply to the web version? Um, yes, but there are still limitations to the web browser that um, we can't really get around. But all the performance improvements we've made are in core. So um, as much as the platform can handle, a lot of that stuff will come through. But yeah, with the web browser, um, there's just some inherent limitations to the fact that it's in a web browser that we won't be able to get around. But right. so things should be faster, but not quite as fast as on Windows. Yeah, you'll always, well, at least for the time being, have that model size limitation in the browser for sure. Right. Um, oh, and Lily from our team was asking, does manipulating parameters to the Dyna groups blow away material assignments? I believe that's still the case, but we can... Well, yeah, only if you've applied the materials to faces inside the Dyna group. 
Um, but if you apply the material to the group itself from outside, that will stay. Okay. Oh, okay, that's good to know. And that I think that was previous behavior, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because once you change one of those parameters, kind of everything inside that group is, yeah, there's a chance it'll get blown away. So the best right. practice is just to apply that stuff to the group itself. Okay. I think we just coined the term Dyna group. So thank you, Lily. <laughs> um, yeah, cool. So like I said, more to come on that uh, as we develop. And if you, we are running a private invite only beta. And if you are interested in uh, joining the beta, then um, please reach out to me directly, either direct message on Twitter or email. Um, and we can uh, look at getting you involved uh, with our beta and you can start trying some of these things out for yourself. Um, so with that, I just want to th thank again, Mike Engel for joining us today, his second visit. So hopefully you have more um, and you can follow Mike. Mike, what's your Twitter again? Is it just Mike Engel? It's uh, Mingle MN at Twitter. Okay. Yeah. Mingle uh, MN. Yep. And you can, if you just go to the forum at 360 this week, you'll see um, a few retweets from him. Um, so, yeah, thanks, Mike. And uh, I look forward to hearing from you around our beta and maybe see you at RTC this year and all the other kind of places that we run into each other. Beautiful work, Mike. Yep. Thanks. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a great weekend.